Welcome everybody and a happy new year. I'm delighted to be here at um, Guy's Hospital for this first of our webinars this year and to welcome people from around the world. Uh, it really is incredible how our community is building and the number of you that are watching this evening um, and thanking here the speakers, the wonderful speakers we will have. Uh, Claire Woodley, community, uh, uh, our, our nurse specialist, Debbie Holloway, another nurse specialist, and of course, Claire Harrison, who's professor of haematology here. Just a few housekeeping things. There is a chance still for you to submit your questions online um, to the panel. Uh, please use the Q&A box to send your questions at any time during the event, and we will do our very best to answer as many as possible. I think the next bit is really important. The panel will not be able to answer any personalized treatment plans. Those you really need to take back to your consultant. One other thing, we would be incredibly grateful if you could please fill out the feedback form because we are continually evolving uh, the programs that we present to the community and your opinion is very valuable to us. Um, and just one final thing again, please use the Q&A box for questions you would like our panel to ask and not the chat panel. So here is our agenda and I'm sure most of you have seen it uh, and I will um, in introduce the uh, speakers in a moment. Just in summary, for those of you who haven't heard of MPN Voice before, and uh, this is your first webinar, I would highly recommend that you look at our website. Um, what we do in summary is we serve the community and the community is patients, their families and healthcare professionals. And our goal has always been to provide accurate and up-to-date information, which is always medically verified. The up-to-date information is always on our website, www.mpnvoice.org.uk. The forums, here we are with one online. We are also now, thank goodness, back to doing face-to-face -face forums, and we have several planned in this next year. We do online support through Health Unlocked, which I'll let you into a secret, is also medically checked. So what you see there will be accurate. Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram. We have evolved with our social media in the last couple of years. And uh, the latest project that we have is looking at developing our very own app. There are vlogcasts. Uh, there are, those are the chats I do with members of the community and we put them up every month. And then we have a young, young people and MPNs blogs. Uh, we have CNS-led support groups. Sadly, they're not in every area that um, MPN patients live in, but it is a hope that in time that will happen. Buddies, really, really important, this. When you're first diagnosed, it's often really scary and um, quite frightening at times. Uh, and I think the buddy system is one of the most successful things we've done with providing one-to-one peer support with approved buddies. To be a buddy, you need to have had a diagnosis for a minimum of two years. Advocacy, that's really important to us to have a global patient voice in the decision-making process, including pharma and government bodies and um, drug approval and availability. We also provide printed information, booklets and resources. And the other thing that is very key for us as patients is to fund research. And there are various fund research, research projects currently being funded, which you can see looking at the website. So I'm now happy to introduce Debbie Holloway. No, sorry, it's Claire Woodley first. It's happened here. Um, <laughs> uh, so Claire, or Claire. <laughs> Hello, good evening, everyone. It is a great pleasure to welcome so many of you to the GSTT support group this evening. Um, and the focus for this evening really is on um, 
menopause. Um, so we're aware that there are many aspects of the management of MPNs that are the same for both men and females and females. However, there are some specific concerns that relate to females, um, such as pregnancy, contraception. And one of the main things that I'm asked about in clinic is about menopause, symptoms of menopause, management of menopause. Can we have um, HRT when we're on um, when we have an MPN. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Debbie Holloway, um, who will be giving us a, a talk on menopause. Debbie is a nurse consultant in gynecology at GSTT, um, and she co-leads a specialised menopause clinic here. So I will hand over to Debbie. Thank you very much. So I think we get the idea I'm going to talk about menopause. So I'm aiming to give an overview of what menopause is, to look at diet and lifestyle adaptions you can give, to look at alternatives and complementary therapies, and then on HRT, including a little bit on vaginal um, problems, testosterone, and then um, hopefully answer any questions that anyone has. So menopause happens to women, and the average age of menopause uh, in the UK currently is about the age of 51, 52. We have different terms, so we have premature, which is when someone is under the age of 45, and premature pregnancy. That can happen through natural causes that we think possibly are genetic or from some infections, and can happen when we take over as well, or um, with chemotherapy or radiotherapy. This time is the period. Stop, and that's when you notice the first change in hormones and you also might notice the first symptoms so it may be some hot flushes and night sweats that are there for a few months periods are a bit irregular and then they come periods come back and the symptoms disappear and this can go on from the early 40s right the way up until the periods finally stop we say you're postmenopausal when you haven't had a period for a year so if there's been no periods for a year you're postmenopausal however the symptoms do carry on so the symptoms can be there and I'll look at those in a minute, but they can be there for some women for five years, 10 years, 15 years. So it's very individual. So when they start and when they stop is very individual. As I've said, the menopause can be natural, can be surgical. So if you go into hospital and have your ovaries removed, then you go into a menopause straight away. And it can also be induced with medication as well. And questions we get asked is when is the menopause gonna happen and how long are the symptoms? And we can never answer those individually and it's normally a retrospective event, event so when you've not had a period for a year you can say that you're postmenopausal. So you have to know a little bit about the menstrual cycle before you understand what's happening with the menopause so this is the normal menstrual cycle this is one of my favorite diagrams because it's very easy to understand um, showing the changes with the with the um, ovary the egg getting ready to release and then um, the, after the eggs release the corpus luteum and then the period starts in the menopause the eggs aren't being released so you get lots of um, the hormones from the beginning of the cycle so that's follicle stimulating hormone and lots of luteinizing hormone as we're trying to make the ovary work and then you get less and less estrogen less progesterone and then the lining of the womb is an influence so it's, it all starts from understanding that and then that might change from a month when you're in the perimenopause Lots of confusion around how you diagnose menopause as well. So um, diagnosis of menopause, according to the NICE guidance, um, which applies to the UK, is done on symptoms and age. We don't do bloods unless um, someone is under the age of 40 with menopausal symptoms, or you're not entirely sure if someone is menopause from 40 to 45. Otherwise, we find we might do the bloods and they will tell us what's happening on that day. It doesn't tell us what's happening in the future. So if the blood levels that we're looking for, which would be FSH and LH, were high um, today, they might be normal in two weeks time. Um, equally, um, if they're normal, that doesn't mean that they weren't normal two weeks ago. So we find that the bloods can be very confusing and can lead to people either being told they're not menopausal or that they don't need treatment. It's always important to remember contraception as well, and the rules around contraception are that you need to use contraception for a year after your periods stop when you're 50, if you're 50 and they stop, and if you're under 50, it's for two years, so it's important to remember that. This is my long, long list of symptoms, and I've grouped them into different ones, so um, to say that not everyone gets all of these symptoms and um, not everyone gets all of these symptoms at the same time. And some people will have symptoms that are much more predominant for them. So the vasomotor ones, which are the more familiar ones, the hot flushes, the night sweats, 
the um, feeling faint, the weakness, the, sometimes the nausea along with the hot flushes as well, and the palpitations. Then there's the psychological ones. And some of these, um, so if you have night sweats and you don't sleep for night after night after night, you can be very tired and equally you can be tired due to the menopause. Um, you can have irritability, confusion, depression, low mood, um, low self-esteem. So some of these will be related to sleep and some of these are there by themselves. Also got decreased sex drive, which is very important to mention that and to ask if, if you're seeing someone, if that is an issue. And this can be due to multiple factors. So um, we find the hormones can decrease the sex drive. Vaginal problems can decrease the sex drive. And actually some people I've spoken to in clinic find that just being next to someone else brings on a hot flush. So being close and having physical contact brings on a hot flush and then can decrease sex drive and put some off having um, intimate relationships. So there's all sorts of things in there. Later on, after you've not had estrogen for a little while, you find that you can be more prone to vaginal infections. Um, so painful sex because the vaginal tissues don't have estrogen in them, more itching, some bleeding as well, um, and um, some urinary problems too. And then we've got others that we don't quite know where to categorize. So um, women complain that they have dry skin, more sensitive skin, dry nails, feeling that there's insects crawling under the skin, particularly on the arms. Um, a change in the bleeding pattern, which um, happens with, with the menopause, joint pains, particularly hands and feet and knees as well. Weight gain that happens, so the weight goes on around the middle. Um, headaches, sometimes migraines as well related to hormone changes. Tiredness, muscle aches, and then a lower bone density and an increased risk of heart disease because estrogen is protective of the heart. So what can you do? So firstly, I think you need to know the symptoms. You need to look at some good apps or some good websites that have got a list of the symptoms, know what they are, try and track your symptoms, keep a diary of those symptoms to see what, what, what symptoms you're having. Um, look at the symptoms as well in relation to how you're feeling, in relation to activities, in relation to food, to see if there's any triggers, what makes it worse, what makes it better. Um, how does it relate to your periods if you're still having periods? and then go and see someone with your, with your information and get some support. It's important as well that there's no one size treatment for menopause. So what works for someone won't work for someone else. Someone will want to use hormones, someone will want to use diet and lifestyle. So it's really individual. And we really have to make sure that um, you're, you have a realistic expectation about what those treatments are going to do as well. So if we're looking, moving on to some of the things we can do, so we're going to start with the lifestyle, first of all. So some of the simple things are trying to keep cool. So dressing in layers rather than dressing in a one big thick jumper, having access to a fan, having access to ventilation. Um, sometimes we keep facial spritz where you can get some menopause mist that you spray on your face when you get hot. Um, a chillo pillar, which is something that goes under your pillow at night, keeps the back of your head cool and then sometimes can help with the night sweats. Bamboo fibers, bamboo fibers or wick away fibers. So you can get those um, in um, sleepwear or you can get them in bed linen as well. And that can help to absorb if you are having a night sweat and then waking up cold. cold. And use those. Um, and it's important to say that a hot flush doesn't affect everyone the same, the same way. So some people will find that the flush will start from their chest and work upwards. Other people will find that it's just the top of their head. Um, it's really important that sometimes stress can make things worse as well. So if you were somewhere in a big thick jumper and then you feel like you're having a flush, it can make it worse if you can't get a layer off as well. So it's important to dress appropriately. So in general, we need to think about other things as well. So we say keep the weight down, which is quite hard. Um, it, Keep yeah. So we need to keep the weight down. So um, in general, um, it's quite hard to lose weight when you're in the menopause. So we need to think about different things. So keeping the weight down is really good for symptoms. Um, it's really good to protect the heart. It's good for joints. It's good for reducing some of the female cancers like endometrial cancer. It's also good for the pelvic floor. So there's a lot of benefits for that, but it can be quite hard. And it does need a good diet, which is on um, unprocessed foods, complex carbohydrates. Um, decreasing the fats and mm -hmm. we, protein. We're going to try to fix the sound issue by giving Debbie a microphone. <laughs> Sorry, we've probably given you some slightly pointy kit. Apologies for that. Okay, so is that better? Yeah, okay. Um, 
Alcohol. I think it's a volume issue. I think maybe maybe you might need to speak a bit louder than you <laughs> normally would. And we can see how we can get on. Should we try again? Drew, are you ready? Give you mine. Yes. <laughs> Okay, is that any better? Yeah, is that any better? Yeah, okay, right. So keep the weight down. Um, weight's really bad for symptoms. Um, so you tend to get more hot flushes, but it's also beneficial for things like the heart, the joints, um, decreased risk of endometrial cancer and pelvic floor as well. It helps with that. So really important to have a good diet. Overall, decrease the sugars, try and cook from scratch if you can, have complex carbohydrates rather than anything else, decrease the fats and increase the proteins. Limit the alcohol. So um, unfortunately we know that some alcohol triggers flushes for some people. Um, so we do know things like some people find that if they have a late meal, so eat after eight o'clock at night, they have a really bad night. And equally, if you have some alcohol, red wine seems to be a really bad trigger for hot flushes. White wine, not so much from extensive research in the clinic and spirits as well don't seem to be too bad, but all in moderation. And I have seen someone that was trying to clear her menopausal symptoms by drinking a lot of beer because it had hops in it and hops are a weak estrogen. So um, I think we have to limit that a little bit. And I don't think you can get enough estrogen from hops in your beer to cure your symptoms. Um, it's also bad for your heart and it's also bad for bones and sleep. Lots of calories as well. Lots of calories, yes. yeah. Caffeine is another great trigger, and some people find that coffee really irritates them and really irritates their flushes, but equally it can impact on sleep. But some people find just a hot drink can do that as well. So when we find, um, so you might find that even if you switch to herbal teas, the hot drink. And when we're looking at all of this, we're not saying you must never have a glass of red wine or a coffee ever again in your life. What we're saying is, think about your triggers. And if you find that coffee is a trigger, you might not want to have a coffee and then go to a meeting where you might be stressed and it might make you have a flush. So you need to think about how you do them. Some foods have phytoestrogens in, which are weak plant estrogens, um, and they can help with some of, the, with some of the symptoms. So that's things like soya particularly, but flaxseed as well, um, and some of the other nuts and seeds too. If you look on the internet, there is a recipe for menopause bread, um, which comes out like a brick because it's full of flax seeds and full of nuts and seeds and stuff but some people say that can help with their symptoms omega-3 we know is good for joints and skin and mood and then um, some natural serotonin found in salmon can help with mood as well so there's all sorts of things you can do for diets as well we like you to keep moving because um, estrogen is really good for bones. And when you don't have any estrogen, your bones can become thinner. So um, it's important to look at calcium, magnesium and vitamin D. Check your diet and have supplements if you need them. Um, really important. Sleep is another issue. So sleep can be independent of hot flushes, can be a problem. You can wake up, can't switch your brain off feel a lot of anxiety as well. So there are some good um, CBT insomnia apps that you can look at that can help with this. And there's also some CBT for menopause, which I'll go on to in a minute, but also normal things like not having a TV or phone in the bedroom. Smoking, I'm going to say smoking is overall bad for health, but also smokers have an earlier menopause sometimes, and they also have worse symptoms than non-smokers. So if you needed another incentive to give up smoking, that would be it there. So it's quite easy to say reduce your stress, um, and that's really hard to do, particularly um, when if in the menopause it's quite an anxious time and you're not entirely sure that you can control the stress or it's affected mood or it's affected you generally. So there are some techniques you can use. 
So we've got um, relaxation stuff, yoga, Pilates, mindfulness can all be useful. Taking time for yourself and then trying to reflect on what you can control and what you can't and trying not to worry too much about the things you can't. The book on the side is um, Managing Hot Flushes and Night Sweats with CBT. So it's a self-help guide and it was designed it's been through a lot of trials for women with the, who can't take HRT in group therapy and online. And this is a self-help version of it. It's really useful for looking at what the menopausal symptoms are and then going over them. It's also useful for reflecting on what you can control and what you can't control and trying to make your brain think a little bit differently about how you feel about the menopause, how you feel about the flushes, how you feel about the sweats and trying to help you sleep a bit better. So it's really worth looking at even if you're gonna use other methods as well. Brain fog is something that comes up quite a lot and there's lots of things that you can try and do um, to help with that. So keeping hydrated is really important. Some of the things that I've already said, so smoking and alcohol, trying to look at sleep, trying to relieve stress, having a good diet and exercise, but connecting with others and socialising, but also trying to do something new that you want to do that you enjoy um, to keep your brain active. So learning a language, Sudoku, crosswords, Tango dancing are all things where you have to use your brain and you take some time for you. So they're really good to try and do. And a square of really dark chocolate. So 70% plus a day is supposed to be really good for brain function too. So you can get a little bit of chocolate in there too. So if we move on to treatments, um, so I'm gonna firstly talk about supplements and then move on to prescribed alternatives and then HRT. I would say don't be afraid of HRT, but we'll come back to that in a moment. Um, herbal supplements may help, but they have a limited range of what they can help with. So mainly hot flushes and night sweats, occasionally mood. They don't generally help with vaginal issues. They don't protect the heart. They don't protect the bones, um, but they may be useful. But they're not neutral. So we have less information about herbal supplements than we do about HRT. And they are sold as a dietary supplement generally. And my advice would be, whatever medication you're taking, you would need to discuss what supplement you were going to take with someone. So examples of that may be um, red clover or black clohosh, uh, and they're both wheat plant estrogens, and they may inter interact with other medications. So traditionally, they interact with tamoxifen, so we don't suggest it for women with breast cancer. We need to try one product at a time. So it's very tempting when you're in the middle of menopause to go into a chemist or a health food shop, look at the range of products on view and just take an armful and see what happens. Most of them have, if they're compounded, they might have a little bit of herb in, they might have a little bit of mineral, a little bit of vitamins, and you won't know what's helping. So one pure product for three months and see if it helps. And if it doesn't, then move on to something else. Otherwise you end up with lots of multiple products, very expensive and not knowing what helps. So Again, going back to NICE, because um, that's where we st start all the evidence for, for here. Um, check that it's got the traditional herbal logo on it, so you know that it's the right product at the, for you in, in the right herb. And NICE has suggested that CBT works as an alternative. So going back to cognitive behaviour therapy, black cohosh will work for hot flushes, but unknown safety. Um, not as good as HRT on sorting out menopausal symptoms. St. John's Wort was really good at hot flushes and mood, but the interactions were too great for it to be recommended. And then phytoestrogens. If you sprinkle soya on your breakfast cereal, it's not going to help. You need a large dose of soya, such as red clover or such as an isoprove in a tablet, and then that might help. But as, as a caveat to that, some women can't absorb it and take the active ingredients out, so it doesn't work for everyone. The studies on acupuncture are mixed, um, but people say even if their symptoms remain the same, they generally feel better after having acupuncture and may sleep better. So there are some alternatives that you can try. We have prescribed alternatives, and these will vary from country to country, but essentially in the UK at the moment, we have four main classes of drugs that we can prescribe. So we have clonidine, which is licensed to prescribe for hot flushes and night sweats and was originally for blood pressure. Um, the side effects can be for poor sleep, and you can't use it if you're on another medication for blood pressure. So that's not so great for some people. And it works in about 30% of people that take it. We use a very low dose of some antidepressants. So we, we tend to use venaflaxin mainly in the clinic here. Um, and we use that because we know that using it as a low dose, so much lower than you'd use for depression, can help with hot flushes and night sweats for some women. However, the side effects are there. So sometimes we need to persevere over those side effects. And it helps about 50% of people that take it. 
We use gabapentin or pregabalin for some people. Um, and again, we use it for a side effect, which seems to be to help with hot flushes and night sweats and also joint pain. And again, it helps with about 50% of people that take it. And we've more recently been using oxybutynin, which is a medication for bladders um, but, and does give some side effects of dry mouth and dry eyes and constipation, um, but helps with about 70% of people that take it for hot flushes and night sweats as a side effect. So it's quite a useful um, one to use. And again, all of these will just deal with hot flushes, and night sweats, with the exception of the antidepressants, which may help with um, some low mood. And then we get on to HRT. So there are multiple different HRTs around and they're defined by their content. So the basics with this is if you have a womb or a uterus, you need to use two hormones. So that's estrogen to help the symptoms and progesterone to protect the lining of the womb from estrogen. Because if we just give estrogen, you end up with hyperplasia, which can be a precursor to cancer and you end up bleeding as well. If you are perimenopausal, so periods are still there then you need to have sequential HRT, which will bring a regular bleed back. And if you're postmenopausal, so not had a bleed for a year, you can use continuous HRT. So that's the both hormones every single day. If you've had a hysterectomy, then you can use estrogen only. And that tends to come out in the studies as safer in relation to the breast cancer risk, um, but is only suitable for people that have had a hysterectomy. And then we've got different delivery methods as well. So we can use it as a, a tablet, we can use it as a patch, we can use it as a spray or a gel, and then um, we can got different risks and benefits depending on whether it's transdermal, through, so through the skin or oral. So there's multiple different choices out there. Some of them are made as a commercial preparation and others we make ourselves to make the right product. So we use an estrogen and different progesterone. So I've said that we can give it in different ways. Um, so this is the sequential one if you're perimenopausal. If people are sensitive to progestions, we can give it every three months, but you do get a very heavy bleed then, or no bleeding at all. So every single day, both estrogen and progesterone. So we would give transdermal to most people. And we give that because we know that there is a low to no clotting risk with most of the transdermal preparations. So that will be the Lenzetto, which is the spray, the Estragel or the Sandrina, which is the topical gel, or the Everall Conti or Everall range, which is the patches or the Fem7 or the um, Estradot. With oral, we do know that there is an increased risk of clotting, and that comes from the oral, oral estrogen and sometimes from the oral progestogens, depending on what progestion it is. Um, so our advice is if anyone has any risk factors, we go for transdermal. If we say saw someone who had a, a, an early menopause, was in their late twenties, didn't smoke, didn't have any risk factors, we would be happy with them taking an oral as well. So our advice varies from person to person. So why do we give HRT? We would give it, estrogen would help with hot flushes, night sweats, mood and vaginal symptoms. Progesterone, as I've said, is just to protect the lining of the womb. Um, but one of the progestions we give you to gestan can help with sleep as well. So that can be quite useful. And then we sometimes give testosterone after we've given estrogen and progesterone if needed. And that's for libido essentially, but sometimes for mood changes as well and lack of energy. Although the evidence is less strong on those, but much more stronger on libido. Lots of questions about bioidentical. So this is where um, you would go along to a private clinic generally and have your bloods maybe saliva taken, and then they would compound a hormone product for you with some estrogens in it and some progestins in it and possibly some testosterone. And then you normally go back after three months, have your bloods done again, and they change the prescription. Um, there is a nice statement on the British Menopause Society website, which talks about bioidentical and how it's, no, it's not better and it's not um, superior to anything that you can have prescribed and we have less research about it as well so we don't give body bioidentical on the NHS we will give body identical which is similar to your own hormones and that will be in the form of a patch or a gel and the utogestan. So we can use testosterone the problem with testosterone in the UK is that it's off license and we don't have any products that are designed for, for women so we have to use an off license product and a small amount of a product that's been made for men. So it can be quite difficult um, to get the right amount and to get the right balance, but we do use it. It's particularly useful for libido, as I've said, but we would always make sure before we went in with that, that we had used vaginal estrogens to make sure there was no vaginal atrophy and um, some estrogen, either as a patch or a gel, to make sure that um, estrogens weren't gonna solve the, the uh, sex drive problem before we went on to testosterone. 
a few myths I've put across by them, so I think you might guess what I'm going to say. HRT causes breast cancer. So we know um, that estrogen only HRT does not increase the risk of breast cancer, but combined does increase the risk of breast cancer. I'm going to show a chart in a moment which will put that risk of breast cancer into context. HRT causes blood clots. Um, and again, as I've said, if it's a patch or a gel or a, a spray, it doesn't necessarily. HRT isn't dangerous if it's given to the right person at the right time for the right reasons. It doesn't cause weight gain, unfortunately, the menopause does. HRT is not a contraceptive, so there's a lot less hormones in there than there would have been in like a contraceptive pill. Um, so it doesn't inhibit, um, it doesn't give you a contraceptive effect. So you do need to use additional contraception as well. Natural methods are safer and that's not necessarily so. And you can only take it for five years. And that's a myth that's persisted for a very long time. And it isn't a true myth. You should take HRT to control your symptoms for the amount of time that you have symptoms at the lowest dose possible. And it should be re re reviewed every year. So you don't have to have five years and then come off and then be left with dreadful symptoms. This is a breast cancer risk chart that we use when we're talking about breast cancer. And so as you can see on there, there's additional four cases um, of HRT for combined HRT um, for women, a thousand women, um, from 50 to 59 taking HRT for five years. Um, if we look down, there's four fewer cases if you're taking estrogen only. Um, if you're drinking more than two units of alcohol a day, there's an additional five. Um, if you're a smoker, there's three. And if you're overweight, then there's an additional 24 cases of breast cancer um, due to the additional estrogen produced from the um, adipose tissue. But you can negate some of that by doing some more exercise as well. So it's important to put it into context of the, how, how much of a risk it is. So the disadvantage of taking HRT, low risk of breast cancer, but that is low, but that does depend on your own un underlying risk of breast cancer, low risk of blood clots. And again, it's low compared to the pill and pregnancy and much lower if we give it through the skin. The same with the risk of stroke, strokes. If we give HRT through the, risk of, through the skin, then that risk is lower, lower. Side effects are one of the main things. So some of these can be related to estrogen or progesterone, and they can be bloating, uh, breast tenderness, feeling a bit nauseous, and then bleeding, um, which happens to a lot of women when you first take HRT, but then does decrease afterwards. Independent of anything else, uh, if you have any vaginal issues, you may need to use some vaginal estrogen. So if you have vaginal dryness or pain with sex, then we can um, suggest this. Vaginal estrogen is safe for everyone to use apart from women who have breast cancer and are on aromatase inhibitors. Anyone else can use vaginal estrogen. Using vaginal estrogen for a year is equivalent to taking one milligram of oral HRT, so one day's worth of HRT. You get the same amount of estrogen over a year if you use vaginal estrogen. Um, and it comes in different ways. So it comes as a pessary, it comes as a cream, comes as a three monthly ring. Um, it comes in a in an oil-based formulation as well. So there's lots of different ways of taking it. Um, and it doesn't cause breast cancer, it doesn't cause strokes, it doesn't cause blood clots, it doesn't cause any, anything at all. If you didn't want to use that, there is lubricants that you can use and you can also use um, vaginal moisturizers as well, which you use in exactly the same way as you would do if you were um, moisturizing your skin. So you put them into the vagina two, three times a week. One that doesn't cause any issues such as thrush and things like that is the yes range and they have yes vaginal moisturizer and they have yes water-based and oil-based lubricants and i've put on there if you're using oil-based lubricants watch out for condoms because they do cause problems with the integrity of those but there are quite a lot of vaginal moisturizers around most of the companies will send you samples so that you can try them and see some of them have a different feel um, some of the um, lubricants that you can get are silicon based as well as oil based. And so it's really a personal choice as to what you find works for you. So if I'm going to give some conclusions, um, just particularly for this group, I would say that on the whole, it is very individual, but HRT could be used. It would be transdermal, so it would be through the skin, but it would depend on other risk factors as well. So it wouldn't be a, some, a choice that we'd make just based on the menopause. You would need to look at your other medical conditions as well. Vaginal estrogens are fine, so absolutely people should continue to use those. The same rules on HRT apply. We give more caution. We don't generally start HRT in women that are through what we call the window of opportunity to do good to bones, 
bones and heart particularly. So if you're more than 15 years from your last menstrual period, we would be very cautious in starting HRT in that age group because it does more harm to start with. Um, and then the risks level out, but it does depend on the symptoms. HRT should be started in the perimenopausal phase if possible, and that's to protect the heart and the bones and to help with the symptoms. HRT will help with the symptoms related to menopause. Alternatives may help, but you need to check the interactions before you start using them. And there's limited evidence of testosterone beyond sexual function. And most of that evidence is related to using testosterone in, a, in addition to using um, HRT. So you need the estrogen there for the testosterone to work properly as well. I've put some resources that we use. So Daisy Network is for women under the age of 40. Um, and it's uh, online and they do have face-to-face -face and very similar to your network, they have buddies as well. Um, they have a buddy system and they have a, a national conference. So it's a really good point of call if you're under 40 and they will take any research that's published that may be quite scary and translate it into that age group as well because most of the research published doesn't reply to under, women under 40. Um, we use Menopause Matters as well, which is clinician um, driven, although there are adverts on there. Women's Health Concern, which is the patient side of the British Menopause Society and all of their leaflets are clinician written as well and do tie in with the guidelines for professionals from the British Menopause Society. And there is some information on the Royal College of Nursing as well on menopause and various other things around menopause and around um, women's health. Uh, a little bit early, but questions? That was amazing. Thank you so much. Thanks for um, putting up with us going backwards and forwards and handing you lots of different microphones and putting you under condition of stress. Okay, well, I'm hoping you can hear and um, We'll, I think we might be passing yes. microphones backwards and forwards, standing and left and really. If you can't hear, just put a message in the chat. I can see a few yeses. I want to say again, thank you so much, Deborah. I think most of us were glued to that, looking really hard and thinking, and, and that, that was absolutely fantastic. Um, I can see two questions in the chat and I've got a piece of paper here and so is Claire Woodley with um, lots of different questions. So I'm, I'm, I think a lot of these questions um, hopefully have been answered, but I'm going to pick out a few of them if that's okay. And the first one to give you a break, Deborah, is I'm actually going to give to Claire Woodley. And um, this is a question about, um, there's two questions actually related to this. And it's really about how do you know the difference between symptoms due to your disease and symptoms due to the menopause? So one of the questions is, I understand from my consultant that night sweats and some other menopause symptoms are the same as ET progression. How do we know the difference? So I know that we often discuss this in the clinic. Claire, do you want to maybe kick off with that? We'll just check first of all, we can hear you. Yep, so thank you. And I suppose looking at that, that great slide that Debbie had up about kind of all those symptoms, um, that you can experience in menopause these were definitely you know i can pick out the 10 that we put on the mpn 10 form that we ask about so and it's often a question i get asked in clinic you know i'm experiencing this but what is it it could be this or it could be the menopause is it my mpn that's causing the symptoms and i suppose for me it's about exploring that symptom with the patient and when did the symptom develop is it new is it intensifying what are the other um, kind of situation for the patient? Um, does that symptom change in, in a particular time in the month? Is there anything else that's contributing to it? We can see that, yes, unfortunately, there are a lot of overlaps. So for us, when we're looking at MPNs, we do look, are you, are you getting night sweats? Um, are they getting worse? And I, and I suppose really it's about that discussion that you have with your clinician in clinic because you're right, you know, for us, when we're um, 
looking at our conditions, we, we do constantly, and I know certainly in our clinics, we're asking you about night sweats. Um, we're asking about drenching night sweats, which could again be the menopause, but if, you know, um, and, and Debbie, I'm sure will correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, but, you know, is this a sudden thing? Does it correlate with kind of changes in your menstrual cycle or, you know, is it something that's developed after perhaps you've stopped your periods and, you know, it's, it's something new that's perhaps happened a longer time after you've stopped your periods. So it's more about exploring how that symptom has developed and how long you've been experiencing it. And are there changes in that symptom for you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I would definitely agree. I think diarying and just keeping a symptom chart for even if it's just a week is really important. And also thinking, did I have this symptom before? Has it got worse? And does it come in that cyclical thing? Is it there all the time? And if you're still having periods, even if they're irregular and the symptoms there all the time, it's probably not related to the menopause. Um, so sometimes you can try and pick it out and see. Yeah. OK, that's a good one. And um, are menopause sweats can occur at any time or hot flushes, whereas disease related sweats, I would say, tend to be a bit more at night as well. So I think that's another thing. And and also the other thing I would say is it's uncommon for you to just have sweating as a disease progression and equally it's uncommon mm. just to have sweating as a symptom of the menopause so yeah. and we, we would of course ask um deborah or someone to see you and give some advice and the other thing of course is you know if we're trying to work that out there are ways of trying to work that out not least to try some treatment mm. to see if it actually works did you want to yeah. comment on that i, I think for, for some things when we're trying to work out for all sorts of things if it's menopause or not menopause if you tried three months of hrt if you're able to take it and it didn't make any difference then you know it's not menopause um but in this sort of case, this might be where you might be thinking, I'll do some bloods to see, because if you did bloods, and you probably need to do a couple of bloods because they do fluctuate, as I said, um, but you may do a couple of bloods and see if it's been, if the female hormones aren't raised at all and the periods are regular, then it's unlikely to be related to menopause. That's great. Actually, maybe we could pick up a bit on this issue of um, blood testing, because I picked that up on your slides. Yeah. and. Um, even we get patients coming and going, can, can I have my bloods done to see if I have got menopause? So yeah. actually your position as an expert in this field is actually in most circumstances, perhaps except that one we were just talking yeah. about, blood testing is not useful and it, and it can be, you need to do it a few times. So you need to do it a few times um, and you can have symptoms when you've got some subtle changes in your female hormones that doesn't pick up on blood tests. So we have lots of people referred to clinic that have been told they're not menopausal when in fact they are menopausal. And you take a history and you can tell that their symptoms are so menopausal. So it's used to reassure people and say it's not menopause and it's equally used to say you don't need any treatment. Um, so it's really not something that is particularly useful to do apart from in certain groups if you're trying to really work out what's happening. Okay, that's really super useful, actually, and that I've learned something from that, as well as other things that you've said. Um, there is a question in the chat, which um, I think that's come from, it looks like Robert, is it? Was it Rachel? Um, what about um, how long does HRT tend to be taken for? And on stopping it, do you get any symptoms? <sighs> So HRT is taken for as long as you need to. And what one of the common myths is that when you take HRT, it just pushes the menopause along. And then when you stop it, the menopause symptoms come. But actually, the menopause symptoms would have been there anyway. So it doesn't push anything along. So if you were someone that was going to have menopause symptoms for two years and you took HRT for three years, you'd stop it and you wouldn't have any symptoms. If you were someone that was destined to have menopause symptoms for 15 years and you took it for five, you would end up with symptoms. So it does really vary from person to person. So what we normally say is you take it um, and most people have an idea with themselves about how long they want to take it for and what their goal is. If you want to see whether you have finished the menopause, and if I could tell people that, 
we would make a lot of money and then we'd not <laughs> we'd be we would just yeah we'd have left the nhs but we can't say that so what we normally say is if you come to a point when you think you want to stop hrt and see what's happening we cut it down and we do it over six months because you do get a little bit of rebound and then if at the end of that six months you've got no other symptoms you could stop taking it and then see what happens. If your symptoms come back with the vengeance, which they may do, then you're not through the menopause and you still need to carry on. So then people go back onto it. So it's a bit of trial and error. And just while Claire's looking at a question to ask, because we've got so many, we've got two pages worth of them. So we won't ask all of them, I promise. <laughs> and we, we've very kindly had your time. What about though, if you want to take HRT because you've got a family history of osteoporosis, or you want to protect your heart, or there are other things, aren't there, kind of yep. Alzheimer's risk, et cetera. So what about that? We don't take anyone off HRT in the clinic. So we've got people in the 80s and 90s still taking HRT. Um, and the, the, the guidance says that you take it for as long as you need to take it, and you have an annual risk review. And so as long as you've had an annual risk review, and the risks do go up the longer you're taking it, but we have... A lot of women that stopped taking it when there was the scares several times have come off it, don't cope very well, gone back in it and said, I'm just going to carry on taking this. Thank you very much. And the risk review is a bit like, is your weight gone up? Are you hypertensive? Any subject? change in medication? How's your blood pressure? Any change in anything? Has, has any other condition happened? Has anything happened that would make us think we need to change your HRT? And for people that take it longer term, we do generally go low dose and transdermal so a patch or a gel because we know that's safer so we wouldn't necessarily have someone in their 80s on a very high dose of a tablet because that would obviously be too risky so we try and reduce the risks as we can yeah so i'm going to try and group together a few questions this i think this theme kind of comes up in a lot of questions that patients have preset and it really relates to, um, and it's probably for Prof and Debbie, the fact that we know MPNs are associated with a thrombotic risk. So um, a lot of the questions are along the line of, is it safe for me with um, an MPN to take high HRT considering the risk of blood clots? I, I would say if it's transdermal, then yes, because the studies that have been done on the transdermal, um, very brave studies done a while ago um, on women that had had a clot and women that had, um, that those women that had a clot were put onto oral and put onto transdermal. There was a recurrence of clots in the oral and not in the transdermal. So we do tend to think it is safe, but it, you need to take that into your own personal situation. So um, we do, give it to women that have had a previous clot as a patch or a gel, um, but it depends on what has happened and their other medical conditions. That would be my point. Yeah, I think that's true. But, but I also think there's something about knowing that you're optimised. So knowing that if you've been advised to take an anticoagulation, mm -hmm. anticoagulant like warfarin or apixaban or rivaroxaban or something like that, that you are taking it. And, and you're really taking it, you're not taking it sometimes. So, and, and that your condition is well controlled because if you have an MPN and you've had a blood clot, we will be trying to control your condition. So I, I think that's um, really important. And I, I think um, there's also a question here, a comment here about somebody saying, well, uh, I can't have HRT unless I get put on a cytoreductive drug. And Debbie, just for background, cytoreductive drug is something that we would use to reduce the risk of blood clotting. So that that may be why that's coming up. Yeah. And and again, that, if that happened, then transdermal HRT would, would be the thing. So I think it is there is stuff you can use, but you do have to do that in combination with talking to people to, to everyone that looks after you about your different health needs. Can I just pick up with you, Claire, just one thing, because it, it is mentioned a couple of times. If patients have already had blood clots, what would your advice be in that situation? I think in that situation, um, it probably would be, one, how well controlled is your disease? Are you to also optimised in terms of anticoagulation? What type of blood clot did you have? How risky would another blood clot 
be what's the organ function as a consequence of that blood clot so many patients with mpns get blood clots that maybe affect their liver for example and then um you know if we're not sure then we may well then say actually deborah could you see this patient can we get a bit of advice because actually uh, as haematologists, we're not experts in HRT and risks of, and I do, and often GPs aren't. So quite oftentimes, we're writing a letter to for our patients, basically saying we're happy for this patient to go on HRT, but please use lowest possible dose, ideally transdermal. But I think that's a circumstance when we might ask an expert. Yeah. And, and I think if you were worried that there are alternatives that you could try first as well. So um, we do that with other people that have contraindications to HRT. We might say, why don't we try something that's less risky and then see if that sorts the symptoms out. And if it doesn't, then have another discussion um, if you do have an increased risk. I personally like the idea of a square of chocolate, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that will protect my, um, my brain very much. <laughs> um, there is a question in the chat just to um th this has come from michelle about actually i've had a hysterectomy but i've still got my ovaries in situ because sometimes when a hysterectomy is done the ovaries are removed as well but oftentimes mm -hmm. ovaries are left in place so could you comment on that please deborah so the ovaries will still be there caught using so you don't go into a menopause if you've had your ovaries left behind um, when you have your hysterectomy your periods will stop but you'll still have your own hormones sometimes with a hysterectomy your ovaries fail a little bit earlier than they would have done because there's an interruption to the blood supply um, but if you've had your uterus removed when you do go into the menopause you'll know that because you get the symptoms so all of the ones that we've talked about and then you can have a hrt in the form of just estrogen only so you only need to have estrogen um, which gives a lower risk of breast cancer Great. I think that's that's really helpful to just to clarify that. While Claire's looking maybe for another question, I'm going to ask a question that's been put in the chat by Michaela, um, who wants to specifically ask about palpitations as a symptom. She says, I've been asymptomatic since starting HRT around three years ago. However, I've recently started to experience palpitations again. How do I know whether this is menopause or MPN rated? or I would add, or something else. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, um, palpitations are very common in the menopause and they normally occur with hot flushes and night sweats. So they occur with those vasomotor symptoms. Um, if you're getting them at any other points, you should go and see someone and make sure that they're not cardiac related or thyroid or something else. So I would suggest going back to see someone um, and then trying to work out what they are, getting some basic tests done to work to work out, are they related to stuff? And sometimes we find if they are menopausal, you may have been on something quite happily for three, four, five years, and then some, sometimes it just doesn't work as well as it used to, and you may need to start trying to change the dose or tra tra change the way you have it. Um, but I would definitely go and get that checked rather than just assuming. Yeah, agree. Um, Claire's looking for questions. Yeah, so I do spot looking, one. Yep. So there's a question about Lenzetto HRT that yeah. they can't seem to get anywhere. So the, the HRT shortages have just been a, a delight over the last few years. Um, so the increase in prescriptions of HRT since some of the media of that has gone up by about 50 to 60 percent. So consequently, supplies are out. Um, if you can't get Lenzetto, then the alternative would be a patch or a gel. Um, and you may have to, I would contact the company and find out if there's a supply issue, because quite often there is. And then um, if there is a supply issue, then you might need to look for an alternative while you're waiting for that to come back in. Okay, thank you. Um, we also have another question in the chat about if HRT does reduce heart and bone risk, should we consider HRT even if we don't suffer with too many symptoms? So the jury's out on that at the moment because you can reduce heart problems and you can maintain bone by doing lifestyle and diet and exercise etc so the jury is out on that and we generally if you had low bone density we and are perimenopausal we would suggest hrt if you had a normal bone density then we wouldn't generally suggest it in the absence of symptoms because of the risks as well so it'd be something that you'd have to look at 
the risks, your own personal health, um, your own medical conditions, and then the benefits, and then try and weigh up between those. But yeah. Um, please do pick a question if you want to pick a question. You're getting them fired at you, but if there's anyone there that kind of jumps out at you as a kind of common question, I, I'm sitting over here squinting a bit at the screen. But So you've got, is it too late to consider HRT at 56? Yeah, that's the question I yeah. wanted to yeah. ask as well. So, there's somebody else who's 56, yeah. So definitely, definitely no. So that would depend when your periods actually stopped. But in that, you're considered in the, if your periods have stopped, early postmenopausal phase so you could consider hrt so we only say, we say within 15 years of the last menstrual period it's fine to start taking hrt um so i would say it, you're not too late to consider it and some people obviously their periods we say the average age of 51 52 but we still see people in clinic that are having periods of 55 56 anyway so um it's not too late no so excellent yep. so claire i'm going to ask you a question before you ask me one um is there any evidence to suggest that menopause may trigger a change in platelet level um i would probably say no actually i don't i don't think that's something that we've seen um in our patient group um say that it would cause any change in your platelet level I think I agree, but I, I would just say, mm, unless you're having very heavy periods, because some women can get very heavy periods, can't they, at the time of menopause? So if you were getting iron deficient, maybe. Yeah, if you don't have a period for a couple of months and then the next one that comes, they can be really heavy around that time or they can be more frequent as well. And then there's also some question about different treatments that we give and um earlier menopause so i i would say i don't think any of the treatments we give for mpms but i'm going to look at deborah as well to see what she thinks so very low dose of chemotherapy hydroxycarbamide similar to what's given to sickle cell patients for example mm. interferon or a, a kind of you know something very light it doesn't usually make patients infertile so no what do if, you think if it doesn't affect fertility then it won't bring on an early menopause. Um, so so yes yeah, so they shouldn't bring on an early menopause although your group of patients may have an early menopause for other reasons and then um something that's really kind of inflammation um of disease so we can drive the disease to develop inflammation linked to symptoms is there any uh, evidence of linking inflammation and uh, menopause so estrogen is generally thought to be anti inflammation so for cardiac things particularly that's why they think it's cardioprotective um, and there was, there is some emerging evidence about estrogen being protective for people of COVID as well. So um, there must, estrogen does play a role in protecting from inflammation. So postmenopause, if you've got less in estrogen, you would have, you, you would lose that. But how that would affect your group of patients, I don't think has been looked at. Mm -hmm. My question to, to any of you as an MPN patient mm -hmm. postmenopausal, what is the effect when you are postmenopausal on the red blood cell count and haemoglobin? Is there any effect? I'll have the microphone back and take that one. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe what you're thinking, all these sound issues. Uh, I think it's a network problem. If they pop chat to you. After they stop having periods, perhaps their iron stores pick up a bit. Mm. And then we tend to see this slight increase in haemoglobin. But I don't know whether that also might be that over time the amount of mutated JAT2 increases 
and so we do see that kind of transition but I think that's the most likely thing um there's a question about thrush actually yeah um so with my medication since my diagnosis I'm getting recurrent vaginal thrush so sorry it's slightly off topic of menopause but um very much in your ballpark yeah do you mind answering that <laughs> no not at all so um it can be related to menopause actually because you have less estrogen so you get more prone to having thrush um and so i would suggest look at look at how often it's coming look at if it's coming if you're having periods when it's coming um and i would also suggest being checked for other things that we can relate to recurrent thrush such as diabetes um, if you're menopausal then you may find that if you use vaginal estrogens then that puts all the right um lactobacilli and things back into the vagina and the, and the right levels of pH and the right balance and then you get less evidence of thrush so using the vaginal HRT even if you don't want to use anything else can really help with that and if you were using other things like vaginal don't use any hygiene products because they're really bad because they, they they cause more issues than that look at using panty liners and pads that don't have any scent in them look at using washing powders that don't have scent in them look at using cotton pants um, thinking about diet as well, because sometimes um, alcohol, sugars, etc., can exacerbate that. And then, if you are going, if you do need to use vaginal moisturisers, think about ones that are pH neutral and, and won't irritate. So it depends where you are. Depends if you're on hormones as well. Different types of hormones, like contraceptive pills and things. That's incredibly helpful. Hopefully, my microphone's working. There's a couple of questions about contraindications and interferon Claire I don't know if you can read them in the chat there's um is HRT contraindicated if you take interferon or is testosterone contraindicated if you take interferon I think we've answered the question about that actually it's fine to take HRT doesn't really interact with interferon but it might, you might need to talk to your team about why you're taking it. If you're taking it because you've had a blood clot, for example, we might need to think about that. But yeah. um, just maybe a little focus again about testosterone and when mm. we might be worried about that, I think could be useful because testosterone is clearly coming up in the chat, yeah. Deborah, if you don't mind. So um, testosterone, as I said, isn't licensed, but it is recommended in NICE if you have sexual dysfunction. And that's the only recommendation you get in NICE. Um, and you would use it um, transdermally. So we use a very small amount. We do, do normally do bloods for this to start with just to get a baseline. And then we do bloods at three months to make sure we haven't given too much. Um, side effects of testosterone can be increase in spots, greasy skin, so male type skin, um, increase in facial hair as well. Um, and um, if you gave a lot, you would get a deepening of the voice as well. Um, so we try and balance what we're doing. Um, it's very useful for if women have had their ovaries removed because the ovaries in all of us make some testosterone. So if the ovaries go, then you lose testosterone. So those are, are a group of women that if they've had their ovaries removed, we would normally replace testosterone as well. Um, so um, it doesn't, as far as I'm aware, because we're using a very low amount, increase the clot risk and it doesn't work very well by itself. It works better when you're using it with estrogen because of the way it binds in the body. Um, and um, we are happy to do it, but it is, for most places, it's a specialist prescription. So it needs to be initiated by a specialist in menopause. Um, that's in the UK because it's not licensed. We also saw a patient actually develop a higher haemoglobin on testosterone. Interestingly, men do have higher haemoglobins than women do. And uh, we've definitely seen a PV lady who was, I don't know if she's listening to the uh, webinar, but um, she doesn't need to identify herself. But we noticed that when she went on the testosterone gel that she suddenly started needing a lot more venisections um, for her condition. Um, there, I think we're laboring a point a bit, um, but uh, there is a specific question about patients who've had PEs and DVTs. So, and I think uh, that could be a patient maybe who's had multiple clots. So 
if someone's had more than one clot, I, yeah. from my perspective, that would be a bit of a worry. But Deborah, did you? I know we've kind of covered that, but obviously mm. we maybe missed I, that nuance. I, I think if you've had multiple clots, and particularly if you've had multiple clots while on treatment, um, that would probably be a no for HRT because it does increase. And I would suggest we look at other things that you can do, so other prescribed. Um, but again, that would be an individual thing. So um, it would probably be a no for a GP, um, but it may be something that you may wish to discuss with a specialist in menopause and look at the risks and benefits that are very particular for that. Um, and we do that for other things as well, like hormone dependent breast cancer. We have a very frank and discussion about the risks and the benefits and, and the unknowns. So I think that would be one of those cases. Okay. Yeah, and actually you very nicely outlined lots of other things that could be done yeah. and things we should be doing for ourselves as yeah. well. I love the book that you put on about mm. cognitive behaviour yeah. therapy and taking some responsibility ourselves. Yeah. I thought that was really very helpful rather than just leaping straight into yes. HRT, which yeah. is, is obviously bit um controversial in the chat there's a question from paula and i really hope paula that you've listened to the webinar and, and if you haven't you know actually you need to go back and have a conversation you can have other things to help you manage the menopause other than antidepressants yeah so find somebody else to go have that conversation with i think and i'm, I'm sorry that you're having that experience Deborah I'd go back and talk about the antidepressants because it's the it's the way quite often you go to see a GP and you've got menopausal symptoms and they say have an antidepressant and it's not a first line but if you can't take HRT it's used as a small amount to treat menopausal hot flushes and night sweats so it's not saying you're depressed and you're menopausal and you're depressed and have these tablets to take and that will make you just forget everything. It's trying to get on top of the hot flushes and the night sweats in most cases. So it's about the way it's phrased and it's about going back and having that discussion and not thinking you're being fobbed off, which is I think a lot of, you've got all of these symptoms and someone says you're depressed, have this. It's, it's, the, it's the cell of it as well. Um, so, so they do work for some people. Yeah. and yeah. i'm actually just thinking that we sometimes use antidepressants to treat itching which is a, a common symptom too so we, we need to remember the mechanism mm. of those drugs and how they work so they do have an effect on mood but they also have effects on other things exactly yeah. as you said yeah. um so i don't know claire yeah, or I deborah was... if there's anything else you can see in that you want to ask? I was going to pick up on the question um, that we have that about fatigue, um, but unsure if it's menopause, my ET, or my medication. Um, and certainly there are lots of things that we suggest if patients are coming into clinic to talk about fatigue that's associated with their MPNs and their medications. Um, so, you, you know, we look at different ways of managing fatigue of the mental fatigue of the physical fatigue and activity and pacing and lots of different suggestions that we have. Is there anything different that you would suggest in menopause fatigue? Um, so it's probably trying to work out what the fatigue is from if you can, um, looking at sleep, which you probably do as well, looking at what interrupts sleep. And if it's menopause that's interrupting sleep, things like the CBT might help with that. Um, and HRT if you can, because that would help with sleep. Um, exercise, I know people don't, but we find for menopause, particularly if you do more exercise, um, you sleep better as well. Um, although it's quite hard to get in there, first of all, particularly if it causes you to have flushes and stuff and sweats and things. Um, so, and then sometimes we suggest things like acupuncture, acupressure as well, because that can help with fatigue. So it's difficult and it's difficult to underpin um, if you're, if you're not sleeping because you're having lots of night sweats, then that can be almost easier to try and sort out rather than that wide awake brain not switching off. So, yeah, the CBT is quite useful for that. And I think it's important to say that, you know, the techniques that you've suggested are techniques that we suggest. So equally trying to manage it through the same technique can actually resolve the issues for patients. And it's not perhaps necessary that you need to have different techniques to manage a symptom but that they will overlap. So actually the approaches to manage them will overlap. Yeah. And I sometimes it doesn't actually matter what's causing it. You need to get on top of it. So, yeah. 
Can I just add here that on the MPN Voice website, we do have some podcasts done by um, a psychotherapist patient, and they're incredibly good for relaxation. And there are several of them. So do look on the um, MPN web Voice website. There's also a little bit on fatigue management on the yeah. website as well. So lots of different resources that you can tap into to try and help with managing some of these crossover symptoms. There's one about the dose of gel, and I'm going to say you need to go back and see someone that's prescribing it. There's no one dose of gel that works for everyone, same as there's no one dose of anything. So um, gel starts from one pump up to four as a maximum, depends where you are and depends what you're using. Um, so um, we normally start low and work up if we need to, but um, there isn't a standard amount. There's also um, another interesting question from Hannah about um, the risks. So when patients are on interferon, they can have a risk of changes in their mental health and depression. Mm -hmm. Would HRT in this patient group, could that also trigger further mental health problems for patients on interferon? So HRT probably wouldn't trigger it, but the menopause might trigger it. And we know that the menopause, you have a difference between having depression and low mood related to hormones. And if you've had any depression or mental health issues in the past, possibly related to hormones like um, PMS and postnatal depression, you're more likely to have hormone issues and depression around the menopause. So um, there can be factors in your history that may trigger it. I, I like the idea of a prescription for exercise yeah. for menopausal women. <laughs> Um, to make it easier accessible and I suppose some of it might look at what type of exercise mm -hmm. you you are thinking of doing for me it's normally a brisk walk backwards and forwards to the station is my yeah. exercise mm -hmm. and running up the stairs at work which yeah. isn't always easy when it's four flights no <laughs> um, the other thing for, for if women are starting out and they are menopausal sometimes swimming can be quite useful because you're in a cold pool particularly if your hot flushes are things and they're triggered when you're in a gym so getting used to doing exercise so being in a pool could be quite useful because it's nice and cooling and then moving on once you've built up more of a tolerance to exercise there was a question right at the top of q and a's about taking vitamin d so uh, the person who put that in i don't think vitamin d particularly helps with menopause but it can help with bone pain sometimes and it's mm. definitely not contraindicated for MPN. So Deborah, do you want to comment on that? So, so we suggest it if someone has um, low bone density or a risk of osteoporosis or osteopenia um, and anyone that has a menopause under the age of um, 50, we suggest takes vitamin D for their bones. We don't normally suggest taking calcium if someone's having a good calcium diet. Um, if they're vegan and not having any calcium, then we might suggest it as well. Um, but that would depend on their bones as well. Um, but yes, it doesn't help with menopausal symptoms. Perfect. And can we have acupuncture if we're on anticoagulants? Claire, did you want to answer that or do you want me to answer that? Um, I, I can't see necessarily a reason why you can't. And I know certainly some of our patients um, have had acupuncture. I don't think there's because the needles are quite small, aren't they? So I, I can't see that there would be a reason why somebody couldn't unless perhaps you are, you are prone to bleeding easily. Um, or if you're on something like warfarin and you have quite a high target range. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily think that it would cause you a problem in having acupuncture. Excellent. One more question. Uh, dry mouth and dry eyes, symptom of menopause or not? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so it can be. So you can get dry skin, you can get dry mouth, you can get burning mouth as well. Um, you can get an increase in tinnitus, um, increase in allergies. There's all sorts of things that are linked with these hormonal changes. But yeah, people do say their eyes, like their contact lenses have been fine and then suddenly in the menopause, can't wear them anymore. Um, so yes, you can. And can it change taste as well, like yeah. a metallic -y yeah. taste and things? Yeah, yeah. and yeah. sense of smell and just generally like sense of touch and things. Okay. Well, I think that's fantastic. And I think we've really put you on the spot a lot, Deborah. <laughs> so um, thanks also to everyone who's been putting questions in the chat. I'm going to ask Deborah to pass her microphone, which is working a lot better to Nona now, so that Nona can close off formally. But thank you from me. 
I, I don't think I'm going to be alone here. I would just like to say a huge thank you to Debbie and to Claire and Claire. I think this has been an incredibly informative webinar. Uh, I'm sure that I've certainly learned an awful lot. And I'm sure, again, I'm not alone there. Um, and it's it's been great for us, and particularly MPN patients where you know blood is a problem. So it's it's huge. Thank you. Um, I just would love to ask the community to give us a little bit of help. Um, we would be so grateful if you could support us with donations to enable us to continue the work we do. We really are expanding really very quickly. And from where we were two years ago, we've come on leaps and bounds, but we cannot do it without your help. So any donation is gratefully received. Uh, you will know we often, you will find on the website and we give information about where the money goes. And uh, you can donate through this QR code on the screen now or through justgiving.com forward slash MPN voice. Um, any queries, please contact Maz at info at mpnvoice.org.uk. And thank you for your support. We're just waiting, we'll move on. I, I would also like to, to say just a huge apology. Um, I think, as Claire said, there are problems here at Guys and St Thomas's with the volume and, and various sort of passing of microphones this evening. Um, but really, again, a huge thank you to everyone in our community for your ongoing support. And a special mention here for the clinicians who've so generously given their free time to support this forum. It's appreciated by each and every one of us. And I, this is the first time I've actually been lucky enough to be here actually in the studio. And I'd like to thank um, Kanchan Joshi, who has taken over looking after us from Danny Palmer. And Danny's here too, and the AVG team in the background. Again, we couldn't do this without you. Um, so many, many thanks. And we look forward to seeing you again very soon. Most importantly, please stay well and keep safe. Thank you.